You know, one of the amazing things about God is that He saves us even from our desires. You know, we live in a world that teaches us if you desire something, you should just have it. And if you feel a certain way, you should just do it. And if somebody tells you, you can't do that even though you want to, it's like, well, what kind of hateful person are you? But just so you know, this is going to be a shocker to some of you guys. I don't eat every time I'm hungry. I know that's a shocker. Marcus is surprised because it looks like I eat every time I'm hungry. But the truth is, I'm hungry all the time. Kristen will ask me after I eat, she'll say, are you still hungry? I go, I'm always hungry. And so she started looking stuff up because that's, you know, she's, she's pretty smart. So that's what smart people do. And so she's looking at stuff up and she said, did you know that some people have a genetic disposition to be hungry all the time? And I said, so that's an excuse for me to eat all the time, which she said, nay, nay. If I ate all the time and every time I was hungry, can I tell you I would weigh slightly more? I know some of you, like Marcus, think I eat all the time, but the truth is I'm not eating right now, so that works. <clears throat> Although I did have a donut. This all right, so this is the most important question of the day. After this, if you need to take a nap, Randy, this is your time. All right, here we go. Most important question. By the way, there's plenty of seats up front now. I told uh, uh, Randy this morning we need to put chargers in the front seats for phones. And then that would be the incentive to come forward. I had a pastor who used to tell me he wished he had rotating seats. So like once everybody sits down, you rotate all the back people to the front row and vice versa. No one would come back to church. By the way, it's packed today, just so you know if you're watching online. There are 50 people also watching online. That's pastoral 50. That means 43. Um, so we're glad. Would you welcome all the people watching online? We're glad. Some of you, health issues, everything. And I won't get to say hi to everybody here. So if you're one of those people that leaves today and says the pastor didn't say hi to me, I'll be here after the service. You come say hi to me. It's your fault now. Okay, so... <clears throat> Did I say that out loud? Yeah. Most important question of the day. Which is your favorite? Cake or pie? Here we go. Here we go. How many of you prefer cake over pie? Prefer cake over pie? Preference? Okay. I see those hands. I see those hands. I see those hands. How many of you prefer pie over cake? Would you raise your hand? Yes, me too. Me too. I prefer pie over cake. Except for one kind of pie. Because I went to a church years ago... And I happened, they said, on the first day I was there, one of the ladies at the church said, Pastor, what's your favorite pie? And I said, oh, I like German chocolate pie. It's definitely not my favorite anymore because every event, everything, all the time, people brought me German pie Every time, I know there's a different name for it. I think I'm saying the name wrong. But anyway, they brought it every time. Every time. We had the pie in the freezer. We had the pie every time. If anybody was sick, if, if I coughed in church, they said, you need a pie. And everybody brought me the exact same pie till I got tired of, the, of that pie. You know, there's a verse in the Old Testament where the people are getting tired of manna and God says, fine, I'll give you quail. And then it says, God gave them quail and I'm going to give you quail till it comes out of your noses. God said that to people and I totally get that because that's how I felt about this pie. Like it was just too much. And here's the problem with desires. If you pursue all of your desires, they will, listen, they will destroy you. And what we're going to look at today, and I actually have to be honest with you, I, I try to do too much with this sermon. It's like flying over the Grand Canyon, and I feel like I'm flying over the Grand Canyon going, look! Okay, so that's what we're doing today. So buckle up, buttercup. Here we go. We live in a world where we're told we should follow our desires, and that's what's happening here in 1 Samuel. The people basically said, this is what we want. This is what we want. And by the way, uh, following the crowd, we're going to talk about that in a second. So how our desires cause disaster? Number one, we focus on things, not God. So let me give you a background. I'm going to have to give you background a couple times today because I'm flying through a lot of passages. The Israelites, uh, they kind of decided, you know what? We're going to go to war because we want to. And uh, we're not going to ask God. We're just going to do it. 
And so they went into battle and they lost. So they came back home and they said, oh, you know what we did wrong? We didn't take our good luck charm, the ark. And so this time they got uh, Eli's sons to go with them and he, they took the ark with them. And Eli's sons, if you remember, were stealing from the temple. They were working for their dad and God even warned their dad, hey, you're letting your kids steal from people and rob people. And they were like, he was like, eh, whatever. And um, so that's where we pick up the story. So the people go back in, they, they take on in battle again, but this time they have the ark with them, thinking, we're bringing our good luck charm with us. And listen to what happens. We pick up in verse 10 of 1 Samuel chapter 4. So the Philistines fought. You might have heard of the Philistines. There was some guy named uh, Goliath. 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 Yeah, Goliath. Okay. Uh, so the Philistines fought, and the Israelites were defeated, and every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost, listen to this, 30 thousand foot soldiers. And then what happened? The ark of God was captured and Eli's son, Hophni and Phinehas and Ferb died. I know I watch cartoons. My wife thinks it's immature. Bowling for soup does their song. All right. So Hophni and Phinehas died. And then a few verses later, Eli heard the outcry and he asked, what is the meaning of this uproar? The man hurried over to Eli, who was 98 years old and whose eyes had failed so he could not see. By the way, I hope my eyes make it to 98 because they're already falling apart and I'm 55. So here we go. The guy says, uh, I've just come from the battle line. I fled from it this very day. Eli asked, what happened to my son? The man who brought the news replied, Israel fled before the Philistines, and the army has suffered heavy losses. Also, <laughs> like a side note, why would you not? Okay, anyway. Also, your two sons, Hophni, Hophni and Phinehas and Ferb, are dead, and the ark of God has been captured. When he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell backwards off his chair by the side of the gate. His neck was broken, and he died, for he was an old man. And I love this. This is going to be on my tombstone, and he was heavy. He had led Israel 40 years. So what happens? Eli has been leading Israel from the position of pushing people towards God. And so now what was going to happen? Samuel was going to take over. Now, why did all of this happen? Why did the ark get captured? Because the people began valuing things over their relationship with God. They began valuing, thinking that God was in the things, and they began to worship the things instead of worshiping God. Do you ever know anybody who carries a, a, a good luck charm? When we went to Taiwan, one of the things I remember is they sold little good luck charms everywhere, every type of God. In, in Taiwan, they would say, if you you know, need luck in a certain area. It's different gods for different areas. And you would buy these different things, uh, often made of jade, and carry them around with you because that thing was going to help you. Do you know anybody who believes in lucky horseshoes? You maybe have a friend who buried a statue in the front yard thinking that their house would sell if they buried the statue in their front yard. My favorite was we had a big cross in church here. And when we took that cross down, you know what was on the back of that cross? About 30 horseshoes. Somebody felt like not only did we need Jesus, but we need a little luck too. And that's what the Israelites thought. The Israelites thought, well, because we have this good luck charm with us, God will bless us. And they did not realize that the important thing was not the ark. By the way, the ark had some really cool stuff in it. It had the original tablets. It had the, the, the snake, uh, uh, Moses' snake uh, uh, staff, thank you, uh, uh, in there and, and just, you know, some really cool stuff, manna, some manna was in there and that was gone, it was taken. Now, I don't have time to read the rest of the story, but I, but I love this story. They bring the ark, the, the Philistines bring it to their temple and their God falls down two different days and then they get plagues and mice and it's an awesome, so you get to read that one later. So let me ask you this, let me look at this verse, Matthew six thirty three. it says, but seek First, and I love the word for first here. The word for first here, if you're a science teacher or if you are a science student, the word first is proton. You remember the proton? You had protons, neutrons, and 
Oh, you're so good. You'll be a good student. All right. So, but seek for... Danielle's watching online. Danielle, I hope you remember that from my science class when I taught you that. All right. So, but seek first his kingdom. Now, kingdom here is not like a castle. And, and it's not like this time of year, you know, you build a sand castle on the beach. That doesn't last. When it says his kingdom, it's talking about his rule in your life. It's talking about Jesus is in charge. You know, we used to use the word Lord, but nobody knows what a Lord is. So it's like Jesus is in charge. So it says, seek first his authority and his righteousness. What is righteousness? Doing what's right. God, I want to do what you want me to do. And all these things will be given to you as well. And that word for given means increase. God's going to bring you increase. Let me ask you this question. Are you seeking his will or things first? See, what God was teaching the Israelites was, I don't want things ahead of me. If you're going to trust in things, I'll let you see what happens when you trust in things. But if you want to trust me, then I'll take care of you if you trust me. So Eli's gone. So there's a leadership vacuum in Israel. Now, Samuel is there, but Samuel doesn't have the respect of the people yet. You understand what that's like. You've got to earn your stripes, right? And so Eli's there. Eli's sons would have taken over, but now they're dead. So guess what? It's up to Samuel. Samuel's in charge. So Samuel begins leading the early people, and they come to Samuel, and they go, uh, Samuel, we want a king. And Samuel's like, uh, that's not a good idea. Do you realize what a king will bring? And they say, we want a king anyway. Basically, they were looking at Samuel going, you know, Eli did a good job leading us, but we'd rather have a king than you. Isn't that a great feeling you would have if somebody said that to you? It's like if your children came to you and said, we'd rather have a coach. I'm sure that's true, actually. Okay, never mind. Number two, we want God to bless our plans. We love to get God to want to do what we do. Now, another point I could have made here instead of God follow our plans, I could have said, what happens when we follow the crowd? They've discovered something about people. And it's really funny because it's a line from Men in Black. And in Men in Black, he says, he says, well, people are smart. And he says, uh, a person is smart. People are irrational, and then it goes on this whole list of crazy things that people do. And can I tell you something? They've actually done studies, and it's absolutely true. But there's a solution. As a group, many times we make bad decisions because we listen to other people. They've actually done studies where they've had a rope that's long and a rope that's short, and they bring a group in and they say, which is longer? And of course, people all say, the long one's longer. But then what they do is they, they tell people when they come in, oh, most people voted that the long one's the short one. And they found that most people will come in and go, okay, that's true. Isn't that crazy? So in a crowd, people often make wrong decisions. Why do you think peer pressure? Don't you have that friend that gave in to something they wouldn't have given in to? Haven't you ever given in to something you wouldn't have given in to if it wasn't for the crowd? And that's what happens here. And so the people are demanding a king. And Samuel's feelings are hurt, honestly. And here's what he says to God. And God, he says to God, God, they want a king. They're rejecting me. Verse 7, chapter 8. And the Lord told him, listen to all the people are saying to you. It's not you they rejected, but they rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt till this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they'll end up doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them and tell them to know what the king who will reign over them will claim his rights. So what's he saying? He's saying, God's saying to him, hey, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. When you choose in our society sometimes to do what God wants you to do, to reject sin and say, you know what? In my life, God has asked me to follow him, and so I can't just follow what I want to do. I can't just do anything I want to do. I can't follow every desire I have. I can't just pursue what feels good to me because I want to follow God. And there'll be some people who will look at you and go, you are so narrow. 
You're judging me, aren't you? No, no, I was just telling you what God put on my heart. If I'm going to follow him, that's what I'm going to do. It's, it's so funny to me that other people will come to Christians and say, how dare you judge those people? And I go, I'm not judging them. I'm just choosing not to live in a lifestyle that I think is against God. No one goes to a Muslim friend and says, you should eat bacon. Uh, well, we're not supposed to eat bacon. No, no, but you should. When people come to Christians and say, you should allow this sin in your church. No, I have to follow scripture. But you know, people won't like you if you follow scripture. Well, yeah. And sometimes the truth is we feel like we're being rejected. But even Jesus said, when they're rejecting you, that they're actually doing is rejecting me. In Matthew 6, Jesus tells us how to pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If we're honest, too many times we pray, God, would you do my will? By the way, I pray this way sometimes when I'm praying for people in the hospital. So if you're ever in the hospital, you may hear me pray this way and you'll be like, doofus. Because I'll say, Lord, I really want them to be healed. Lord, I really want you to do what only you can do. But Lord, your will be done. Boy, people hate that last part. They're like, I just want to be healed. I don't care what God wants. Right? And I've prayed for friends that I begged God, God, would you heal them? And he didn't. At least not the way I thought. I know they got eternal healing. I know they're better off without me. I know all those things. But the truth is, uh, my will be done. And if we're honest about it, sometimes we need to release our will for God's will. Is there any area of your life where you're choosing your will over his will? Are you asking for God's will or your will is the next question. And so let's just be honest about it. And like I said, sometimes I have to pray, God, you know what I want? And I hope it lines up with what you want. By the way, one of the good ways to pray is, God, would you give me your desires? God, would you change my desires? By the way, God doesn't, you may still have a thorn in the flesh. You may have something that you struggled with since you were 11 years old that you will struggle with when you are 80 years old. But it doesn't mean you just give in to it and say, well, I've struggled with it, so I'm just going to do whatever. If I did that, I would weigh 5,000 pounds. I love food. I do. I love food. I would eat all the time. I'd eat right now. I'd eat in front of you. I don't care. <laughs> but we can't always pr pursue what we desire because what we desire many times is not good for us. You ever want to punch your boss in the face? You ever want to punch a church member? No, I have never wanted to. Just... Number three, we need God's grace. You ever feel like a failure? I got home last night. I did not feel like the sermon went well last night. I had a baby crying the whole time. It was just one of those nights where I went home and said, that was the worst sermon I've ever preached. I have one of my favorite, on Twitter, one of my favorite Christian uh, artists, uh, musicians from the 80s. Uh, is on there. His name's Brian Duncan. And here's what he posted yesterday. At this point, I lack the confidence that I used to have about playing and singing music sometimes. It's true that none of us get to stay where we've been. This is a guy who's performed for millions of people, sold hundreds of thousands of CDs. I know that's old records, even tapes. I don't think eight tracks. And yet he felt discouraged. He felt like a failure. You ever feel like a failure? Everybody does sometimes. We feel like we don't always have our act together. And yet, here's what's so awesome about God. By the way, how many of you have ever made a mistake? Brian, raise your hand twice. Both hands. So even though the people have made a mistake, we need God's grace. Listen to what God does. And this is Old Testament. People always say, the God of the Old Testament hates us. Listen, listen to what he says here. Do not be afraid, Samuel replied, verse 20. You have done all this evil. Yet do not turn away from the Lord, but serve the Lord with your heart. Don't turn away after useless idols. They can do you no good, nor can they rescue you because they're useless. Now listen to this. This is what God's saying to them. For the sake of his great name, the Lord will not reject his people because the Lord was pleased to make you his own. Time out. 
Have you messed up? Have you blown it? Have you done something dumb? You know what God says? You're still mine. Do what I've called you to do. That's why he said to Peter, feed my sheep. He said, Peter, do you love me? Peter's like, uh, you know, I uh, like you pretty good. It's like, Peter, do you love me? No, I'm a good friend of yours. Peter, do you love me? Okay, God, you know all things. So you know whether I do or not. And he said, feed my sheep. Basically, just do what I've called you to do. Obviously, I love you. And too often, we're so hung up on our failure that we forget that God says, don't quit, quit thinking about your failure. Yeah, you've already chosen the king. Yeah, you've already got Saul. Congratulations, that's going to go really well. But I still love you. I still care about you. That's the whole story of the prodigal son. When the prodigal son comes home, the dad doesn't look at him and go, I think it's great that you ran off and did all kind of stupid things. No. What's he do? He wraps his arms around him. He doesn't justify what he's done. He knows that what he's done is wrong. That's why the son repents. But the father doesn't even let him finish repenting. As for me, be far from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. And I love that. Samuel's like, you know what? Even though I'm mad at you guys, I'm going to keep praying for you. That's what Samuel says here. That's awesome. That's like somebody going, you know, even though you've done some stupid stuff, I'm just going to keep praying for you, okay? I'd like to quit, but God won't let me. I mean, that's what he says here. But be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with your heart. Consider what great things he's done for you. And then it says, if you continue to do evil, know that you're all going to die. So he says, you know what? God hasn't rejected you even though you rejected him. So run back to him. You ever have that moment you feel like you're not very lovable? You ever feel like a failure? I made a big mistake this week. I missed a deadline by two weeks and cost a whole group of people 1700 dollars. That was exciting. Felt so good getting that phone call. Oh, by the way, you missed the deadline. What? What deadline? You know the deadline. No, I don't know what deadline. We all have those moments. Matthew 6 says it very succinctly. Jesus says it's it's the prayer. And forgive us our debts as we've forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us From the evil one. So here's the final question. Are you walking in forgiveness? The good news from that video. And the good news from the sermon. And the good news from this Old Testament story. And the good news from the prayer of Jesus. Is it's never too late. To come home to Jesus. So even if you've been running. Even if you've been living on your own. Even if you feel like God doesn't love you. Or care about you. Even if you think I've made the. God you have no idea what my mistakes are. Yes, he does. God, you have no idea what my desires are. Yes, he does. And he still loves you. And you're always welcome to come home. If you're here today and you've never come home to Christ the first time, you can do that today. You can surrender your life to him. Say, Jesus, I want to follow you the rest of my life. I'll be here after the service. And you can say, Eric, I want to give my life to Christ. If you're here today and as a Christian, maybe forgiveness is because you haven't forgiven yourself. Because maybe you have been stupid. Maybe you've done something foolish. Well, forgive yourself. Ask God to forgive you first and then choose to forgive you. Maybe there's somebody else that hurt you. You don't have to lessen what they've done. You don't have to allow them back in your life, but you have to choose to let them go, to forgive them. And so ask God to give you the grace to do that so that you can walk forward. We're going to have our time of giving next, but we're going to pray right now. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Lord, I pray that you would change our desires, give us your desires in our lives. Father, when we pursue desires that are against your will, help us to know that we are welcome home with you. Lord, for those times we fail, for those times we mess up, Father, I pray that we would know the goodness of your grace. And Lord, just like the song says, amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. Father, thank you that no matter our condition, your grace is greater. We choose to receive that today. In Jesus' name, amen.